the organizations like Arizona State University, um, uh, Southern New Hampshire, uh, University of Maryland, and a handful of others, took them 10, 15, 20 years to scale to that volume. So it's not like you take what we're all doing collectively and you know, take it to that next level. Um, so the decision was made to go out and talk to the individual companies, I mean not companies, but um, universities that already have online programs that are robust, that have very strong platforms, te te technological platforms, that if we purchase them, uh, we could build upon that platform and grow our program. Uh, the primary focus um, for uh, UMass Online and, and evolving to the next level is to really go after uh, the adult population, individuals who have started a degree and who have never completed. Uh, right here in um, the South Coast area, there are over 300,000 individuals who have started a college degree but never completed. Uh, so fundamentally, and from a philosophical perspective, the idea is that um, this more robust program, uh, as it is created, will uh, put us in that space um, as the University of Massachusetts to uh, address the needs of the adult market. Uh, as I understand it, um, they are looking at and have been looking at a number of institutions to acquire, to create a separate college. Don't know that it will continue to be UMass online. Uh, it will be primarily focused uh, on the adult population. Um, and you probably have questions. So, um, you know, will uh, students from our campus and every other campus be able to take classes, you know, on this platform? Uh, who's going to be in control uh, of curriculum and instruction? And will that hollow out our uh, online programs? And what does that mean if I'm a professor currently teaching uh, a hybrid? Or what about the student who's taking five classes and wants to take three classes face-to-face -face and uh, two online and you know who gets the revenue or are these going to be the same classes blah, 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 blah. and the answer to those questions uh, simply put is I don't know and uh, I think there are more details to come um, they are looking at an acquisition no one seems I, I should say no one um, uh, we as chancellors only know what I've told you so far. Surely uh, someone has more details. Uh, President Meehan yesterday at his, um, uh, the State of the University, um, you know, talked about this a little bit. Um, what you read in the, in the paper and what have you in terms of details is about all of the information that's out there in the public domain. As I understand it, uh, Don Kilburn and his team have been under non-disclosure. Um, so they can't really talk about the details. Um, President Meehan also said yesterday uh, to us that he wants to visit every campus uh, and talk to the faculty and whomever else uh, would like to come uh, about this and what it's going to mean uh, for the University of Massachusetts. Now having said all of that, you know, I'll be the first to say that having a robust uh, online uh, platform to uh, supplement and complement the work that we do uh, each and every day uh, is required in the higher education market. Uh, I like to think of it as how we really have a robust click and mortar model, right? The face-to-face -face experience is never going to go away as far as I'm concerned. And those who argue that this will you know, help um, you know, the poor students to get their degrees at a much lower pr price are just absolutely wrong. Uh, I grew up in Detroit, and the notion that the neighborhood I grew up in, that you would graduate from high school and sit at your house and be on the computer and get your degree is just a non-starter. And beyond that, there's a whole uh, socialization process that needs to take place in terms of what we do, that you bring people here from all walks of life who get to know each other, and that's part of the educational experience. So the notion that the, the traditional college campus will go away. It's just, it's not true. 
Uh, but is there a hybrid version where you have, you know, even our students, we, our current students, they want to take some stuff online, and many of the faculty here, you have hybrid classes where, you know, part of the semester it's face to face, and part of it is is, is online. So th there's a need for that. Uh, the devil is in the details. When President Ian comes here, uh, we've had a conversation with Mike Goodman uh, to try and schedule a time uh, for a full faculty senate meeting uh, that will be open. Uh, so it's not limited to uh, people who are on the Senate uh, or, or who are in the Senate, uh, uh, faculty members, staff, anyone who wants to, <clears throat> excuse me, who wants to attend will be able to do that. Any questions? <coughs> yes, sir. As, as so speaking for my own selfish best interest as a parent who has a daughter uh, at school here right now and member of the ESU, Remember, factor in the benefit for the ESU members who have kids in school uh, that there is benefit related to the online experience. And I wouldn't want that to get lost in, in the details. It's a generous benefit. It's one that I'm taking advantage of. It's one that I wouldn't want to see uh, disappear. Okay. Yes. Uh, I realize you know it's very early. Details are uncertain or unknown. But can you assure us that, as Chancellor, you're going to fight to protect? the uh, primacy of faculty in both curriculum development and perhaps more importantly, the assessment of uh, academic programs well, offered so under the auspices of UMass. So, so let, me, let me be uh, unequivocally clear. Uh, the faculty control the curriculum, and outcomes, instruction, and everything that has to do with teaching and learning. We must fight, I will fight, uh, to pre preserve that uh, at all costs. So think about this, and here's a rhetorical, ret I'm asking a rhetorical question. You know, so you have someone who is an adult learner who started a degree, or maybe someone who is an adult learner who's just starting a brand new degree, um, who normally could not enroll into any of the UMass campuses, okay? And you know, Mike, Goodman, Dr. Goodman asked a question earlier today, so are we required to take those transfer credits? You know, those are the kinds of things that we have to look at to preserve the sanctity and quality of instruction, of the curriculum, and education here uh, at UMass Dartmouth and on all of the campuses. I don't think we want to compromise that. I think one of the reasons why they're looking at setting up a separate college is because uh, by and large, if you look at many of these programs that ASU, Southern New Hampshire, and others have, uh, they are for the non-traditional, um, and I shouldn't say really use the word non-traditional, they're for the adult student uh, who may have started a degree and never finished, or who needs to get a degree in order to move to that, to that next level. Uh, but if we were to look at their uh, credentials based upon what they have to date, they would not be accepted to any of the UMass campuses. So part of our um, uh, responsibility is to make sure that there's a clear separation between what we are doing and what we will continue to do to protect the quality um, uh, and the responsibility of the curriculum, uh, make sure that that stays within the hands of the faculty. I don't know what it will mean in terms of who will the faculty be with this new entity and, and all of that. I think the details are, are yet to be determined. But yes, you have an unequivocal commitment, and we have to be in this, 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 this fight together. Uh, I think that there are more questions than, than answers at this point, and um, we need to do whatever is necessary um, to protect uh, the best interest of the work that generations have been doing on this campus for many years to make sure that we continue to evolve to the next level. Yes, sir. Can we coordinate so that uh, students will have a similar opportunity to speak with President Ian and ask him how this affects their day-to-day? -day? I think you should be at that meeting. When he comes to campus, he says he's going to visit every campus. So this will be, you know, we, you know, 
I asked Mike Goodman to schedule it. <clears throat> Does someone give me some water? Okay. Um, I asked Mike Goodman to schedule it, um, to, to create the schedule so that um, so that we can make sure that faculty were there first and foremost. And you said, well, why is that important? Um, it's, it's, it's important because of the question that Grant just asked, okay? You know, I would be, all of us would be irresponsible if we don't protect the sanctity and the quality of instruction and the curriculum and learning outcomes that must be and only be the faculty. So what I would say, well, what about classes? Well, my guess is it might have been scheduled at a time when most or all of the faculty can be there, then you're probably not going to be in class. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yes, yeah, so we would want you there as well. We need to make sure that the students know whenever, whenever we have the final day. Other questions related to this issue? Wow. So you all are saying that for President Mina. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, but we're we're in this fight together, and 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 when I say in this fight, I'm not talking about us fighting the UMass system. I'm talking about us fighting to make sure that we provide a quality education and provide as much access uh, to many as many students as we possibly can as we go forward uh, as an, as an institution. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is, you know, shortly after I arrived. Uh, there were a number of people in my office, and um, Jim was one of them. I can't remember everyone else. And they said, you know, what are you going to do about commencement? Is that the expense? And uh, I said, you know, I'm just here. Well, you need to change it. Well, you know, it's August. You know, you don't just change it on the whim. So I went to the Xfinity Center last year uh, for my very first commencement. And, um, um, you know, it was rainy and cold. But that's me here and there. I've been to commencements when it was rainy and cold, but that was a cold place. So I'm here to tell you, it is official. We're bringing commencement back to campus. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and it's going to be on Friday, May 10th. Um, the undergrad is gonna be on Friday, May 10th, and grad is gonna be on that, grad and is gonna be on the Monday, following that, 11th, 12th, on the 3rd, May 13th. Um, so, but it's going to be on campus. So for a number of you in the room have been part of that planning process, thank you, thank you, thank you. But most importantly, um, we were at an event, actually last night at the reception, a number of our alums were at the State of the University uh, event. And a couple of them came up to me, where's Jennifer? She's not here. She'll be here later. Um, uh, they were saying to me, Man, you know, I, you know, why why couldn't that have happened? You know, oh, when I was graduating, and there was one young man who said, "I was the last class that actually graduated on campus, and I'm so glad that you're bringing me back." Uh, but you know, people they spend you know you know a number of years here with family, with, with their friends and faculty, and to be able to walk out of commencement and be able to take that last favorite picture with your friends and family is so important. So we're really, really excited about that. Um, I want to uh, move on. Um, I'm getting ready to turn the program over here uh, shortly to um, um, Dr. Donna Liska. Um, I sent out a, a notice uh, letter a few weeks ago about her uh, title being changed to Senior Vice Chancellor. And people said, well, what does that mean? And what does that mean in terms of the organization and what have you about your chief of staff? There is no chief of staff any longer. Um, um, her new title is senior vice chancellor. And it's really about operations and how we function as a leadership team and how we move forward uh, uh, organizationally. So, you know, we have uh, uh, Muhammad, um, who is um, um, executive vice chancellor and provost, uh, and deals with all academic issues. Uh, Donna, uh, as senior vice chancellor, will be responsible on the operational side, and the two of them will kind of be a tag team of making sure we keep all of the trains running on time uh, operationally. And also, when I have to travel out of state or what have you, 
we have to leave someone in charge. And the way that it has been and the way, and the way it will continue to be is that when I'm out of town, then Muhammad is in charge. And if for whatever reason he's not available now, Donald will be in charge. Uh, Donald will also fill in for me uh, at events, um, internal and external, when I can't be there. I think the best example I can give, and some of you have heard this story now for the third time, um, is you know when we had a called um, board meeting a couple of weeks ago. Um, that was you know we were given like a week advance notice, and at the time of the board meeting, uh, I had Lieutenant Governor Polito scheduled to be on campus. You know, or you mass board meeting, Lieutenant Governor Polito, Lieutenant Governor Polito, okay. <laughs> Um, Donald attended the board meeting on my behalf. And, you know, so it's things like that. And as a result of the lieutenant governor being here uh, and her understanding many of the challenges that we have with infrastructure, you know, she said, so has the Secretary of Pizer been down here, Secretary of Education? I said, no, we've been trying. She's like, he needs to get down here. He needs to see it. And um, yesterday, he walked up to me and said, um, I'm told that I have to come down to the campus. So, um, but this is how it works. And also, as we go forward, um, you know, I, I have to get out there and really start raising uh, some money. Um, so the more that I'm away, you know, having the right things and the right people in place to um, um, make sure that all operations are going smoothly is really, really important. That's what it is, no more. No less. And it's budget neutral. So, you know, it's not like we're spending more money or, or anything um, in, in that regard. So I'm going to turn it over to Donna, and she's going to take over a portion of the program, and I'm going to come back and talk about some other things, and then we'll have questions and answers. Thank you. Yesterday, taking over from the Chancellor meant I got to be the lucky one who woke up at 5 o'clock for the snow call. So you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, I want to talk today about the plan, the framework, and the process for the next strategic plan. And I want to emphasize that what I'm actually talking about here is not the plan itself, because we haven't written it yet, and we haven't collected all the data yet. I'm talking about the process by which we will formulate the next strategic plan. Um, if you look at the calendar, you may remember that our current strategic plan runs until 2020. It is now March 2019. So we're coming up on a deadline and we have to be thinking ahead to the next strategic plan, which will push us forward to 2025. The Chancellor likes to talk a lot about the future of work, about being prepared for the future. So right now our working title is Future Ready. You must see 2025 Future Ready. So before we move on to talk about what we did, uh, what we're going to do in 2025, it's useful to reflect on what we've done because it's actually quite impressive. And I should say what you've done. I wasn't here to implement all these things, but quite a lot has been accomplished as part of the 2020 strategic plan. The first goal was around research and academic programs. These are some of the accomplishments. The first bullet there, perhaps the most important, this university put a stake in the ground saying it would have uh, achieved tier one national research status, and it did. We got that. Um, we have new doctoral programs. We have new STEM master's programs. We have new interdisciplinary undergraduate programs, and we are accredited at the highest level as an institution and also for all of our colleges. So these are all achievements under the current strategic plan. Oops, I went too far. Goal two, student experience. I'm sure the students in the room would say there's lots of things left to be done, and that is true. But we have remodeled some labs. We did some significant upgrades on athletic facilities, specifically the baseball and the softball fields. We've increased access to a UMassD education with things like the proximity rate for students who live in New England and who now pay a lower rate. They're not considered out of state if they live 15 miles away in Rhode Island. Um, or in New Hampshire. Um, and we have improved our academic support. So um, things like uh, in, in arts and sciences, we consolidated and improved our support services for students. For goal three, research and scholarship, we have improved our student-faculty ratio from 18 to 1 to 16 to 1. We are now drawing more than $26 million annually in research funding. 
we have, uh, Alex Fowler is going to correct me slightly on this, we have at least 16 high prestige grants, including Fulbright and NSF grants. And, uh, as you know, if you've been in, to it in New Bedford, we built a $55 million building, a new SMS building, right on Buzzards Bay. It's quite lovely if you haven't been there. Again, all achieved under the, this current strategic plan. Under community engagement, Matt Roy talks about this all the time. As a body, our students contribute more than 260,000 annual service hours to the South Coast. Um, we are involved in regional economic development via the Blue Economy Initiative. We have an ongoing partnership with South Coast schools that many of you know about that brings sixth and seventh graders. I believe every sixth and seventh grader in New Bedford and Fall River comes to campus at some point. And in the past year, we've signed six new memorandums of understandings with Portuguese universities and institutes. Finally, infrastructure. The chancellor was just talking about getting Secretary Kaiser here to talk about infrastructure. Um, but these are some things that we have done in that direction. Um, we had a 7% increase in new students in our first year class coming in this year. That's the class that would, not the class that graduates in 2018, but the class that enters in 2018. We did complete the campus master plan. Now the next challenge is to implement it. We secured $25 million in new state funding for the renovation of the envelope of the Seng building. As you know, if you walk by lot six and the former lot seven, we're building a new first year living learning uh, buildings and dining buildings, and they have continued all through this relatively mild winter. The cranes have been going, I hear them. They're right outside my office. Um, and we did a number of energy savings initiatives under this current strategic plan, including steam lines. I understand the center of campus before I got here was pretty ripped up for a while, but that's all done. Um, and we have that nice green there now, and also the co-generation plan. So it's important to reflect back on what has been accomplished as we now look forward to what we want to do next. As we get ready to undertake the 2025 strategic plan, we're not starting from scratch. We actually already have quite a bit of data. When the chancellor was new in the fall of 2017, he did a listening tour where he talked to more than 30 groups about um, people's hopes, dreams, concerns about the university. And we have all of that data written down, lots of information about that he gathered then. We're in the middle of our reaccreditation study. This is NECHI, formerly NEASC, for those of you like me who are still on the old acronym. Um, so we, are, we have to do a very thorough self-study looking against all of these standards, accreditation standards. So we've gathered a great deal of data, Miley Carrera and others are working on this. That's data that we have available to us. As you know, we have a campus master plan that came out last year um, that, we, that gives us a lot of information about the needs of our infrastructure. Um, and of course, the chancellor is also, many of you who are staff know that the chancellor makes his way around to have coffees. Uh, those of you who are students may know that he uh, shows up in residence halls later at night uh, and does chats with the students. So he's been popping up, he'll do eight o'clock in one residence hall and nine o'clock in another and 10 o'clock in a third. Um, so he's been gathering a lot of information from students. So this is the base that we're starting from. We're not starting from ground zero. That touchy thing. Thank you. Okay, so um, as we get ready to gather data, we thought that we needed an organizing principle. And what we've decided to do is to just create sort of four big buckets, I would say, in which to funnel our information or gather our information. Um, these are not perfect words. This is not, it's hard to come up with exactly the right phrase, but let me explain what each one is and then I'll say a little bit more about how we're gonna look at it. First one is discovery. By discovery, we're thinking specifically about research. We are a research one institution. What should our goals, our metrics, what should we be looking at in the next strategic plan in terms of our aspirations as research? The second one is learning, kind of a no-brainer. We're a university, right? What does it mean to be a learner? What does it mean for our graduate and undergraduate students to attend this institution, and what will it mean looking forward to 2025? Employment, we, we talk a lot and think a lot about the future of work. We think about the region that we're in. Um, who, are our, who, who are the people who live there? How are we as a university contributing to the future, the economic future in particular of this region? Finally, the fourth one, community, is the most inward looking. 
Who are we as an institution? What are our values? What is it that we care about and that we want to be known for as we look forward to 2025? So again, this is a rubric and a framework. I don't know what the answers are going to be yet. None of us know what the answers are going to be yet. But this is a way that we're going to organize the information that we'll be gathering. So each of the four pillars is, is associated with a working group. Um, we have identified the working group leadership. And I will tell you who they are shortly. Um, they all will have faculty, staff, and students on them and in some cases also community members. Each group will be charged with gathering input from internal and external stakeholders. We centrally are not gonna be prescriptive about how they do that. So the groups might have slightly different processes. The one thing we are clear about is that they have to have student, faculty, and staff representation, and they have to gather data in a systematic way that will help them set these goals. So each group then, after they gather data, will recommend goals, timelines, budgets, and metrics associated with their working group for the 2025 strategic plan. Budgets are very important up there. And actually, when David Gingero was interviewing, I was chair of the search committee, he said this, you can't do a strategic plan apart from a budget, right? Because you could, um, in a strategic plan, say, well, we want to add 100 Nobel laureates to our faculty. Well, that's all well and good, but we probably can't afford to add 100 Nobel laureates to our faculty, right? So you have to be, you have to be living within your means, and you have to be thinking about what you're going to spend money on and what you're not. So each group will make some recommendations, and then one lucky winner from each group will get to serve on an executive committee that I'll pull together, and that executive committee will synthesize and prioritize all of the input from the four groups and work to put it together in a cohesive plan, which in all likelihood I will get to write over a very happy month. The other thing that we will think about is what are the necessary enabling projects, right? In order to do some of the things that we aspire to do, there may also be first step projects that need to happen. Right? Sometimes you can't go from zero to 60 without doing something else first. So if we decide that we want to be known, I'm just going to pick an example, we want to be known for a specific engineering program, well, we may have to build a certain kind of lab first in order to make that happen. Right? There's sometimes there's an intermediate step. So we'll be thinking about what the intermediate steps are too in order to accomplish the goals that we're setting in the strategic plan. Oops. Let me stop there for a minute. Any questions about what I've said so far? Okay. Oh, Tyler, go ahead. Uh, where does infrastructure fit in? Where, because that's in the campus master plan, implementing that is set. So. Infrastructure fits in everywhere, I would say. Um, there's nowhere that it isn't an issue. So I think all of the groups are going to have to consider it. That's an excellent question. Okay, so the discovery group, this is sort of faculty research and also instruction. And again, I've, I've gotten some really good feedback from some of the deans about how the language could be different or more precise. I'm gonna, and I welcome that feedback, I'm gonna say again though, this is just a way to organize and the exact words might change. Um, so, uh, Chandra Oral, who runs the Coppet Center, Alex Fowler and Provost Kareem are the leads on this. But again, they will be recruiting faculty, staff, and students to serve on it. I'm sure volunteers are welcome if you're chomping at the bit to sign up. They'll be looking at things such as developing interdisciplinary research centers, designing degree programs that meet student needs, and supporting faculty research at a high level to encourage it. That's not an exhaustive list. Those are examples, and the job of that group will be to develop the metrics, the timelines, the goals, that should be part of the 2025 strategic plan. Learning, student experiences and outcome. Tracy Ferreira, Tess Moresi, who works with graduate students, Shannon Finning, um, who is our Vice Chancellor for uh, Student Affairs, and again, lots of players to be named later that will be added to this group. They will be looking at things such as student-centered academic support, student competencies and mindsets, reimagining the residential experience as new facilities come online. Here's the, here's the infrastructure piece, Tyler. Implementing student-centered elements of the campus master plan 
do we need to make it a goal to you know to get the campus center renovation done within this strategic plan? That's that would be an example. So that's the uh, that's the learning group. Employment, regional economic and workforce development. This group in some ways already has, is already working or has already begun some of their work because of the blue economy. Mike Goodman, who's our faculty senate president, Ron Bala, John Hoey, plus faculty, staff, and students to be added. They'll be looking at things like the blue economy, degree completion options for South Coast residents. I wrote this slide before President Mia made this announcement last night. So it's possible that could change a little bit. We'll see. Collaboration with key regional employers. We have certain employers, Dell, EMC is a good example, that employ a lot of our graduates. So we should be talking to them. This group would probably want to have some conversations with external stakeholders, such as employers who employ our graduates. Finally, and definitely very importantly, future of community for thinking about our own competencies and values. Andrea Klimt, Angela Callahan, Jennifer Chrysler um, uh, are interested in this one. Vivian Salahana has also, been, has also committed to this one. Um, and again, we'll be recruiting folks who are interested. Diversity and inclusion, core value for us. Community presence and impact, sustainability, very important to all of us, service to others competencies such as optimism and resilience. Again, these are examples. So the final strategic plan may have different language in it and may have different goals in it, but these are the kinds of areas that they will be exploring. Timeline. So, first bullet, we're announcing it today. Um, the groups will begin meeting after spring break. Um, my expectation is recognizing the academic calendar that they'll meet some. Um, between now and the end of the semester. Um, there may be some work that continues over the summer for those who are 12-month employees. Not everyone in the room is, or not everyone is here in the summer, I should say, by contract. Resume in the fall. The idea would be that the groups, the, 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 the groups would report out their findings towards the end of the fall semester, and that then we would be synthesizing it and putting the document together. I say by the end of the calendar year 2019, I may ask for a little bit of grace on that, depending on how quickly the work comes together, but I'll talk to the chancellor about that when the time comes. Um, we expect to have a final document done, certainly in the spring of 2020. That's what we're looking at. So that's the process, that's the timeline as we know it so far, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. If you're interested in one of the committees, then you should talk to one of the names uh, at the top of the slide. So who, which committee were you interested in? Uh, the, community. the community one. So that's um, Jennifer Chrysler, who is, raise your hand, Jennifer. Talk to her. Talk to me. Afterwards. And if, you can always ask us if you, if you uh, and I, uh, volunteers are welcome. Definitely volunteer, so that you don't have to be voluntold, as some of you will be. <laughs> Okay, um, before the chancellor comes back up, uh, I think Mike Barone is gonna say just a few words about the budget process for this year. If you have questions, concerns, want more information about the strategic plan, um, dlisker with a K at umassd.edu, please get in touch with me. This work will begin, we'll be getting underway immediately.
they provide us with certain assumptions, we make other assumptions, we build a high level university wide budget, submit it, they ask questions, we go back and forth, etc. Ultimately, uh, it gets approved in hopefully June, uh, the last couple of years it's actually been July, uh, board meeting. And then afterwards, budget allocations occur uh, out to uh, the colleges and other departments. Uh, this year, uh, we felt it was important, and I think in any year it's important, I think it's important every year uh, going forward, uh, and that any organization, corporate, university, or otherwise, should have an internal, more of an internal, somewhat more certainly inclusive uh, budget process. And so that's what we strive to, to begin to do this year. A uh, little bit of a low-key fashion, frankly, uh, because we considered it a first step to something that I think will become more formalized, a little more sophisticated, hopefully, going forward. Um, so the, the top three lines up in the upper section are intended to indicate really what was a, a different about this year and, and, what the, and, and you know, what the character of that was. So essentially we talked about it, we, invite, we invited, we communicated out to the leadership, essentially the deans and, and, and major functional leaders about what we were kind of interested to talk to, to them about, meet with and talk to them about uh, as, uh, for the upcoming budget. Um, uh, another memo followed on that was more specific, and then we scheduled out uh, individual sessions uh, with each of those uh, leaders, um, about 20 in total. Uh, each of the deans, again, major functional leaders. Uh, we asked, invited, uh, and I was very pleased to see that the provost office participated in uh, every single one of the, not only the colleges, but sort of the other major functions that the provost office is responsible for. So it was um, kind of, I think, I think, a good coordinated effort in that we were all sort of hearing about it together, discussing it together. Uh, we provided in advance uh, some data reports uh, out of the accounting system uh, as sort of a baseline for discussion off of which we might ask some questions or which those who are coming in might uh, comment on that data. Uh, but I was also pleased to see that in every single session, uh, the person coming into the room brought their own data. Uh, I think that has pluses and minuses, frankly. I think the pluses it showed me us that they were very proactive uh, in wanting to convey to us how they saw their budget, what their budget needs were, in some cases certainly what their wants were. Um, but uh, also it indicated that they had different numbers maybe than we did. <laughs> so I think the goal, and it wasn't surprising, I understand it, but I think that because the data we pulled, and I acknowledge this in each meeting, wasn't quite as integrated, wasn't quite as smooth as you know as we would hope going forward. And we knew that as we were assembling it, uh, again, for the first time in, in some time. Uh, so I think a goal there will be, you know, in, next year, will be to have a more integrated, uh, a more formalized uh, set of uh, data at the table that we all sort of were looking at uh, together. Um, the, uh, we took notes in each of those meetings uh, because in several cases, whether we asked a question and someone gave an answer so they'd get back to us, or more importantly, we said we'd get back to them, uh, we wanted to keep a record of that so that uh, we were following through on, on, on what we had committed to. I said kind of low line, you know, a little bit of lower expectations going into this. Uh, we didn't ask for, um, some, some here I, I found used the phrase budget hearings from the past. It wasn't intended to be that, it wasn't public, it wasn't um, what I would, at least going into it, what we intended to be a major proposal, uh, frankly, uh, and I think to maybe, and, and maybe perhaps in this forum and other forums we've talked about how the budget is quite tight, and that's a reality. So we certainly didn't want to present kind of a misleading picture that, um, you know, there's a pool of money here, and you make your best pitch and maybe you'll get some of that. It's really, uh, there would be hard, some hard decisions, I think. I could imagine, just you know, conceptually, that there may be some reallocations as, a, as an outcome of that. That's possible. Uh, certainly when you have strategic priorities, you have to make those decisions. Um, so that may be an outcome. But we wanted to make sure we were having a conversation. So that was essentially the goal, was to re-instill sort of a dialogue that I think had been missing, uh, at least on that annual basis. We also talked a little bit about capital. It's come up already uh, you know, in this meeting. Uh, when I say capital, I mean the need. We all know there are great uh, needs for, uh, for facilities, uh, for maintenance and so forth. Um, and it is the case that while we've had a 
that operating budget, and this all leads to an operating budget that will be submitted uh, to the President's office and for board approval, we haven't really had a capital budget in place. Uh, Don referred to a capital MAC, and you've heard this before, but presented to a capital master plan in the past. We've had outside, there's outside consultants that visit all the campuses, all sight lines, and they give us a great report that tells us where we stand, and all of you, you know, know uh, in your individual, uh, 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 you know, the areas in which you work, uh, many of them, it just, it's, it's apparent. So we know those needs are there. Uh, but we haven't really dedicated funding specifically for capital. And uh, that's an important need going forward. So again, in these conversations, we asked uh, people to kind of talk to us about it some more. What are your priorities? Uh, again, beginning that conversation in again. Uh, but also with the idea, and as we were going through it, thinking about and trying to see where there's opportunities in the different uh, funding sources, if you will, to perhaps begin, because we really need to begin to set money aside uh, for capital purposes. So um, the where we're at is um, the budget uh, is due to the president's office at the end of this month, and then you, then in the lower part you can see that again it's a lot of back and forth that'll go on. It occurs with every campus. That part is the same with all the campuses in the system, um, and then ultimately approval. Uh, I should mention that one of the key items in this, and I know this will probably be of interest and it gets a lot of discussion, is the uh, is tuition rate. Uh, and one of the reasons why, when I mentioned earlier that the uh, board meeting, uh, approval meeting is intended to be June, the last couple of years has slipped to July, is it gets a little complicated about when the board feels they can make that decision uh, on what tuition increases will be or perhaps won't be. Uh, but uh, uh, it, and that has a lot to do with sort of the state funding and, and their you know sort of their timeline on when they're committing to the funding. So it may well be July as it was last year, but we're hopeful uh, for kind of a sooner conclusion uh, to the budget. Any questions? Yes, Mike. I think we're overdue for uh, an update from the budget board review. Uh, if, if that's something that could be added or considered for the campus based process, especially in light of the budget going to the President's office. I think we met in the fall. I think we were scheduled in January and got kicked ahead, so I think that's just something that we, we need to consider. The, the advisory board, you mean? Yes, good point. We did that one. We were going to, and I, I, I think you're right, Jim. We scheduled it. As I recall, I'm a little vague on this at this point. I think what happened was is when we started to schedule those 20 sessions, we were pretty flat out with them, but, but absolutely, that's that we, we know it's, it's a commitment to do that and to make sure we hand that back off and just restart that process. What he's saying is he's going to hand it off to David. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, he said David will get back down. Yes, indeed. But I agree. <laughs> yeah. 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 budget process. So if you will recall, um, several times in, over the last semester in particular, uh, back in the fall, and somewhat in the spring, I told you how we were trying to come to understand uh, how the budget has historically been built, you know, what has gone into it. Um, you know, Mike, as a forensic accountant, will tell you uh, we probably didn't have the best protocols processes and systems in place. So even though this was a very kind of watered down budget process to create the FY20 budget, as we go into FY21, uh, I would expect um, that it will even become more engaging and more inclusive as we, as we built it, as we build the budget. Um, please keep in mind that our budget <coughs> deadlines are driven by the system office, and we have to back into it. Uh, I think it's fair to say now, for the most part, uh, what we understand uh, 
in terms of what is actually in the budget, that we feel relatively comfortable with those numbers. I don't know that a year ago I could have stood here and told you that. And I think one of the examples that Mike gave is that you know, you know, some people came to the budget meetings with their numbers, and their numbers did not align with what the budget office had. But we understand that now, and we know, we know why, because of very bad systems. <laughs> and you know, what, when we change something uh, in the budget office, and we don't tell you as a manager that that's been changed, you're still operating under former assumptions. And I think so we're, 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 we're driving the car literally while we're rebuilding it, uh, but we can't stop. You know, so if you can imagine the hood is off and somebody and the car is moving forward and somebody's, you know, take pulling parts out of the engine, not that it'll stop, uh, you know, taking a spark plug out. Do they still use spark plugs? Yeah, it's taking a spark plug out, you know, and then putting a new one in. I mean, that's kind of what we've been doing over the course of the last year. And I also want you um, um, to, to not forget, you know, something that I said to all of you last fall. I get it. I get your frustration uh, with the budget and what we have uh, told you in the past because um, it was a house of mirrors, you know, and there's a lot of uh, um, uh, people moving things around and the left hand did not know what the right hand was doing. Eventually we'll get to a point, um, and I haven't had a chance to talk with David yet, uh, perhaps for the next fiscal year in FY20, but definitely by FY21, where you know every budget manager will have a monthly budget versus actual as it relates to expenditure. So for example, you look back in your respective department and see what you have spent uh, on a monthly basis for the last three years. And we take a three-year rolling average. And if you, you know, if by September um, 30th, if you have normally spent $90,000 out of your budget, not including personnel costs. If you spend 110,000, that's going to be a red flag for you. But that's also going to roll up into the division of leaders uh, box as well. And if their budget is out of line, they don't know exactly where to go. And then it's going to roll up to me for all of the division of leaders. So we'll know on a monthly basis where we are budget to actually. That's how you know most organizations, every, actually every organization where I've ever worked, that's how you generally manage it so you're not caught off guard at the end of the first quarter or second quarter or third quarter uh, or God forbid in, in April or May <laughs> and you said, oh, we have this budget shortfall. You know, we should know that long before that and be able to make the adjustments accordingly, sometimes at a department level, sometimes at a divisional level, but most importantly, we understand why the budget is out of kilter. When we just throw all of the money in one big pot and hope that it shakes out at the end, that makes it a bit difficult. So for example, we know for a fact that at least for the last three years or so, uh, maybe longer, that we've always budgeted in terms of budgeted uh, for operational expenses somewhere around 73, 74 million dollars. But if we go back and look over that same period of time, well, we've actually only spent anywhere from 64 to 66 million dollars. Well, you may have not known that, but I'm sure someone knew that, and that's how we would have these these mixed messages about you know whether or not we have a balanced budget or not, whether we have a surplus or not, whether we have a deficit or not. Um, so we're trying to do better. So I think we're better off today than we were a year ago, but we're nowhere um, close to where uh, we should be as an organization that uh, roughly has a, a overall about a quarter of a billion dollar um, budget. So uh, I want to thank Mike Barone uh, for uh, his work and his leadership uh, over the last year. Um, he's handing it off to David, and David no pressure, um, uh, but we will continue to be transparent with the budget. Uh, we will provide the numbers as, as I have in the past, and um, you know we're, we're, we're headed in the right direction. So thank you, Mike. Any questions? Yes, sir. 
So for your area in particular, now that David is here, I think we'll have a better answer in, 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 in very short order as we begin to look at your operation. So, um, you know, the bad news is, is that we've had an interim as the Vice Chancellor of AMF for the last year. The good news is that David is here and we can, can begin to really do a fair assessment as to what's needed, what's not, and, you know, you know, I'm making this up. If you need to hire for seven positions and we only have money for two, which are the best two to hire for? So, you know, I, I didn't want to make that decision. Um, we didn't want Mike to make that decision. We wanted to have a permanent leader in place um, in that regard. Okay. Yes. Other questions? So I'll take another shot at it. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, much more 40,000 feet. Uh, mm -hmm. You said earlier that the elephant in the room was the online program. Mm -hmm. I, I have to beg to disagree. I mm -hmm. think the, the elephant in the room mm -hmm. is the future of higher education, especially in the New England oh, market. Oh, well, sure, sure. What, yeah. I, what I'm wondering, if, as all of us have you know, read the Boston Magazine story mm -hmm. about higher ed in Boston, particularly in the industry as a whole, but specific to New England, um, what's, what's your take on sort of the fiscal health of UMass Dartmouth as an institution, but in the larger picture, what are the things that we're doing as a campus uh, to avoid the pitfalls that other institutions have uh, have gone down? Uh, because I think the concern for everybody, union, non-union, mm -hmm. student, faculty, staff, everybody is, what's the fiscal health of UMass Dartmouth? And as we move forward, um, you know, what, what's in our future? A lot of us were here in 2008, 2009, when, yeah, we, when, when we hit a, a really rough patch, mm. uh, and I think we worked together and we survived that. Mm. If something like that is going to happen, uh, what do you tell people, you know, what do you tell your folks uh, about higher ed in New England, specifically for you, Matt Okay, so um, let me talk, speak to the higher ed in New England first, um, and actually higher ed across the country. As, as well. Um, there's going to be a contraction in the market. You're going to see um, some more private colleges and universities closing or merging. You will see some uh, more public universities uh, closing or merging. And, and we, we've seen that consolidation if you go over and look at in Connecticut, okay, and see what they've been going through for the last several years. And down in the state of Georgia, we're talking about public higher education now. Uh, they have reshaped and reformed um, their system. Uh, specifically, uh, here in New England, uh, when you look at the demographics, uh, the numbers are absolutely the worst of any other region throughout the country. And, you know, so it's, it's, it's going to be a knife fight, it's going to be a gunfight in, in many ways to get uh, students to enroll at, at any particular institution. UMass Dartmouth, specifically. So, so yeah, are things tight? Uh, are we fiscally healthy? Yes, okay. Um, you know, one of the things I can say as a result of having Mike here and us going through the books, it's not like somebody's been you know, stealing money or anything like that. We don't have any of those issues. Um, um, do we have a, a lot of inefficiency? Absolutely. So number one, I think that that's one of the opportunities for us as we begin to build more efficiency and try and build a model for truly a 21st century university um, to um, make our operations more efficient. And don't translate making operations more efficient as to you know, getting rid of a bunch of people. That's not, that's not what I'm suggesting at all. It's looking at every division throughout the campus and saying, you know, how do we need to do work differently? So think about this. Um, I spoke um, a few weeks ago um, to some college presidents uh, about this, this, this very issue. And you know, you've heard me talk about the future of work and young people, you know, 17 different jobs. But are we really asking the question, 17 different jobs throughout their career, but are we really asking the question, what does that mean for us in terms of the university, in terms of how we operate? I think our model has to be one that is, uh, and I mentioned it earlier, is click and mortar, okay? So we have to continue to drive our enrollment with our traditional 
undergraduate and graduate programs. The institutions that understand what their true value proposition is, and they have outcomes that are measurable that families can buy into, they're going to be fine. The institutions that take the bunker mentality and say we're going to wait until the storm passes and hope things get better, they're going to be in a, in, 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 in a lot of trouble. So we need to be looking at, in this constant state, uh, not only looking at our operations, at our programs, our majors, you know, are there degree programs that we started 15 years ago that are irrelevant? You know, are there degree programs that we started a few years ago that are very, when I say relevant, I mean in the sense of uh, students are going into those majors and deciding to attend college. Like data science, okay? It's one of the fastest uh, growing jobs out there. We have a data science program. One of the conversations we had this morning with the deans is I was scratching my head and said, I don't understand. Why are we not turning students away from this program instead of trying, instead of being in a position where people aren't coming? It's because we're not telling our story. So for UMass Dartmouth, to the extent, number one, and there are, there are probably three to five buckets, and I want to take a minute to talk about each of them. To the extent that we're able, in a very succinct way, talk about the outcomes that we already have that are very, very good. I mean, being a tier one national research university and every uh, academic program that can have accreditation, has the highest level of accreditation, is a real value proposition. Uh, if you look at the cost of a private college education versus a public university education, we have a real valuable, uh, a real good value proposition. Return on investment. This is not me talking. Payscale says we are in the top 11% in terms of return on investment, on investment uh, for our graduates in terms of earning power. We need to be telling that story. Our students graduate from here and get into the best graduate schools on the planet. They go work for the best companies on the planet. And I'm amazed whether I'm here in Massachusetts or if I'm someplace out of state and I tell the story, people are like, really? UMass Dartmouth. When I talk about uh, SMAS and the great work that they're doing, when I talk about our public law school, it's value proposition. We have not done a good job in just telling our story. Some institutions have to really go out there and make up stuff, and it's all aspirational. So that's. That's behind bucket number one. Bucket in, in bucket number one. Bucket number two, enrollment, 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 enrollment. I know people don't like to hear it. They don't want to hear me talk about it. But the overwhelming majority of our revenue comes from enrollment. And one of the reasons why our enrollment had, had, had been dropping uh, in previous years is because we were graduating more students than we were bringing in the first year between undergraduates and graduates. I mean, it's, it's math, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's not complicated. I think last year, we graduated uh, the largest graduating class in the history of UMass Dartmouth. Good news is students are graduating. Um, but we only brought in uh, 13 or 1,400 freshmen, for example. And the year before that, it was about uh, 1,100. But I was looking at some data. Once upon a time, we were bringing in 17, 1,800 freshmen every year. We're an institution that has just over um, you know, 6,500 or so undergraduates. I mean, it's, it's basic. I've been in the business a long time. We should be bringing in somewhere between 1,750 and 2,000 freshmen every year. If we tell our value proposition, I know we can win. And I've seen that anecdotally um, just over the course of the last year year of talking to families um, and they're looking at us and some other institutions and when we tell our story, they decide to come here. So enrollment, 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 enrollment. And that's recruitment and retention. And we're all in the business of doing that in our own way. I think the third thing is making sure that, um, uh, that, that we are making sure that we have the highest quality of instruction uh, that is possible. Now, there are a lot of things that come with that. Ultimately, faculty control that. And we have to make sure that our students understand what that is and how it works. Fourth bucket is infrastructure. We have a crumbling infrastructure. Most of this campus was built 
around the same time. So to no surprise, at the end of the day, it starts crumbling at the same time. So we have to have a budget model where deferred maintenance is built into the budget, which leads me to my fifth bucket. Uh, my guess is, so well, right now, about 25% of our budget comes from the state. 10 years from now, that will be somewhere between 12, 10, 12, maybe 15% if we're lucky. So one of the things that um, the senior leadership team have had heard me talk about is how do we build a financial model where we essentially create a 10% operating margin, okay? That's going to mean efficiency. That's going to mean doing work differently. It's going to mean utilizing technology differently uh, on multiple fronts. And by the way, if we believe and we know, according to um, uh, the research, that the nature of work for any of our graduates will be in this constant state of change and fluctuation. What makes us believe that as an organization that the same is not going to be true for us? What I want to do, speaking to your point, Jim, is um, maybe at the next town hall meeting, um, We'll spend 45 minutes, and I want to show you all the data, but I also want to show you the way out. Part of the way out for us is the non-traditional market. You've heard me talk about this. And the non-traditional market, or the adult market, is not individuals who have just started uh, a degree and never completed. It means that every person that we graduate from here, if we give them a good experience, that they can come back here and get credentials, certificates, graduate degrees, whatever the market may demand. And some of that will be done, how? Virtually and online. So if we look up, if we think about our 52,000 alums, and we think about all of them at some point having to go back and retool themselves, if we could just get a fraction of that market, Jim, that provides the additional revenue to offset some of the, the, the drop drop in demographics. Now a lot of people, they're running scared, or they're scared straight about the, um, the demographic drop. I've been doing this for 30 years, this is not the first time demographics have dropped. But the one thing that is consistent, the institutions that says, okay, we just need to weather the storm for three, five, seven, ten years, however long it may be, inevitably their enrollments drop and they end up in, in dire straits. We're not going to do that. We have to figure out how to evolve into a different type of institution uh, that operates more efficiently, uh, that is meeting the demands of uh, not just what, what, what students want, but what employers want. Um, and we're not just, and we're giving students both the mindset and the skill set to go out into the world and be very, very successful. Um, you know, I was, for those of you who were at the community breakfast, um, and we had um, a two of our students and a faculty member uh, from the Interior Architectural Design Program uh, present. Uh, the young man came up to me afterwards. He was from Mount Ida. And he said, you know what? And he's a senior. He's going to graduate this year. He said, man, since I've been here at UMass Dartmouth, this has been the best educational experience that I ever would have imagined. It far exceeded my expectation. But here was the punchline. And I said to Jennifer afterwards, I said, why didn't we capture it on tape? He said, I wish I had come here from the very beginning. Okay? So my, 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 my point is, how do we tell our story so that that kid understands who we are as he or she is making the decision to go to college in the first place? That is the opportunity for us. And I believe more often than not, we will win rather than lose the battle in that regard. Now, and I'm not cavalier about, about this by any stretch of the imagination. Is this going to be easy? No. It's going to be hard. The bad news is we have to do this. The good news is so does everybody else. You know, and the better news is, as I'm sitting around the table talking to my colleagues, other college presidents, and, you know, and I sit on a lot of panels and stuff, and they know all of this stuff. And I say, so what are you doing about it on your campus? Nothing. Philosophically and intellectually, they understand it. Okay? 
but they're not doing anything. We're going to have a call to action, which, and this is going to lead in actually into my next um, kind of talking point. But Jim, did I answer your question? Uh, and, there's, and there's more. There's a lot of work to be done here. But I don't want. I don't want you all to think that this is doom and gloom, and it's and it's the end of the world. We have this unique opportunity. Um, you know, we're small enough without being too small, and big enough without being too big. If we can drive enrollment and just give students um, uh, a better experience while they're here, if we can, you know, get programs like data science off the ground. Uh, in, in, in a more robust way at undergraduate and graduate programs. I mean, just by doing that, if we could tell that story properly, we would have 100 more students enrolled right now. Right now. And we have other programs like that as well. So the possibilities are only limited by us and our imaginations. You know, I've been working hard over the last uh, year or so to get to know the campus, to get to know the culture, uh, trying to build a team. And this is a change model, right? You know, and you know, change is coming, change is coming, change is coming, change is here. Um, but my first year, I'm trying to learn the campus, and you've heard me say this before, trying to hire a new team. Um, as I get into my second year, a good portion of the team is in place, and um, you know, they're starting to, to learn the campus, but they're also starting to change their team. And it's normally, you know, with a change model with an organization of this size, it's somewhere in that 12 to 30 month window of my tenure. That's the real slaw, where it's hard. You know, well, what about the budget? You know, in Transform 2020, one of the bullets was, we're gonna align the budget, you know, to support the strategic plan. Well, we didn't do that. And not only did we not do that, we had a very flawed budgeting process. Well, we've, we've figured that out. We know generally what the numbers are and as, going, as we go forward, we're gonna fix that. That's still within that 12 to 30 month window, right? Uh, you have new vice chancellors coming aboard. They're starting to take a look at their operations. They're starting to make changes. You know, they're, they're, they're are high performers and there are people who are not performing. And high performers ought to be, are, ought to be rewarded and, and, and people who are not performing or God forbid, not doing the job at all, they, they, they need to go. You know, what are our values and what are we about? You know, we're here but for one purpose, to meet the needs of our students. And if we don't do that, then why are we here? At the end of the day, why are we here? And, you know, I've heard a lot of discussions, um, you know, in public settings uh, with a lot of people, with a few people. I've been in one-on-one -on -one conversations. And I am convinced that by and large, everybody here, the overwhelming majority of everyone here, wants to do a, do a good job and wants to make a difference. But I gotta tell you, it's hard. And this place, UMass Dartmouth, which is a great and wonderful place, and I've worked at five other institutions, I've done a bunch of consulting at a number of places, the culture here is hard. And I understand some of the cynicism because of how you've been treated, how you've been lied to, you know, how you've been misled. It, and it's not fair, it's not right, I get it. it took me about a, a little over a year to get it. I think it was at the Faculty Senate um, uh, grant where I said, you know, back in October, November, I said, I get it. I get why everybody's so ticked off and anybody who's in Foster Hall and, and, and talks about a budget. I said it to, to, to the facilities group when, when we met, actually right here in this room. I get it. Time and time again, you, you've been misled. And, and now, so somebody else comes along and says, okay, we're gonna fix this, we're gonna work together, kumbaya, well, okay, we should. <laughs> no, right, that's fair. That's fair, I get it, I get it. But what I also know is as we think about taking UMass Dartmouth to the next level, we are only limited by our imaginations. I think about all that you were going through when there was a vacuum in leadership and how you were able to tier one, you know, national research status, advance the institution and all of the other accomplishments when I look at just metrics of outcomes in terms of how an institution are measured, highest level of accreditation for uh, all of the programs that can receive accreditation. With all of this other nonsense going on, what might 
might happen <laughs> if we all work together <laughs> and we're all marching to the beat of the same drum uh, with a strategy and a vision and a set of core values that we all believe in, there's nothing that can stop us. This is no longer woe is me and the glass is half empty. This is no longer I give you a million dollars and you say, well, I got to pay taxes. <laughs> no, this is about possibility thinking. Possibility thinking. I've seen institutions with far less do far more simply because everybody worked together. So my commitment to you is that if we work together, there's nothing that will stop us. And by the way, I'm not going to always get it right. <laughs> Thus far, I haven't always got it right. Sometimes I've had to say, oh, you know what? We've got to go back and do it differently. You know? I, it's, but, but who among us is perfect? <laughs> you know? And by the way, if I was perfect, I wouldn't be doing this. <laughs> I'd be working on an island, you know, remotely, three months out of the year, sipping on mojitos, you know, zooming in every now and then. Uh, but that's not life. That's not practical. And by the way, we have to get this right. In this region, we are the 20-ton gorilla in the room. We have this unique opportunity to transform lives. And if we get it wrong, we really mess up somebody's life. And that's not acceptable. You know, so it's, it's a rhetorical question. Why are you here? Remember when you came here three years ago, five years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, whatever, whenever it was, and you first stepped foot on campus that first day of the job, and how you felt like, wow, this is great. And then, after you got here, things happened, or didn't happen. And maybe you said, well, you know what? I'm a good person, and I just want to get my 10 years. Or, I'm just going to do my job, keep my head down. And uh, when the bad noise is going over there, I'm just, I'm just going to ignore it. You know, I, I'm just going to do it. I want everybody to go back to that first time you came here and why you came here. That's what we're about. That's the opportunity. That's the possibility. And if all of us work together, you know, we're only limited by our imaginations. I'm excited about the possibilities. And it's fraught with trouble and problems and Stuff. If Michelle was here, my wife, I'd say something else. <laughs> but nothing that we cannot work through. And if we, as a community of learners, just like I say to the students, you know, you know really embrace this idea of what it means to be a, an educated and engaged citizen and embrace civility, mutual respect, you know, in civil discourse. We're supposed to disagree. That's what happens in the academy, right? But it's like, we're brothers and sisters. We're going to fight. But she's not going to stop being my sister. And as a matter of fact, if somebody messes with her, then I'm going to fight them. That's what a family does. But it doesn't mean we hate each other simply because we disagree. We can agree to disagree. And as long as at the end of the day we stay focused on the students, that's what's possible. That's, you know, who we are. And it also represents the possibilities of what and who we can become. And it doesn't matter whether it's teaching, research, or service. It doesn't matter if it's at the operational level. It doesn't matter, you know, if you're on the front lines. Um, you know, cutting the grass, shoveling the snow, uh, keeping the lights on, paying the bills. Did you pay the bills, man? The other, we were here the other day and the lights went out. <laughs> you know, you know, I'm just playing. But, uh, but, uh, but it's, 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 it's all of us. And this is a complex organization. And oh, by the way, we are under the umbrella of this little thing called the UMass system. And um, I won't talk about that. <laughs>
but um, we're going to do our thing. We're going to make it happen. I think in my inauguration speech, I said something to the effect, you know, you know that you know, if you stand up and you believe in your dreams, I will fight for you. I will fight for this campus. I won't give up, no matter what. But it's going to take all of us in order to make it. Um, there are a lot of things discussed today. There are a lot of things not discussed today. I'm happy to take questions about anything. Yes, sir. Uh, you talked about uh, drawing students in and the I, future. I, I'm sorry, what you said? Yeah, sorry. You talked about drawing students in and the future of the workforce. Mm -hmm. uh, well, knowing that my generation and future generations um, will be more aware, worried, and focused on sustainability and climate change. Mm -hmm. How will your administration focus on adaptation to and mitigation of climate change? And what are your plans for a sustainability director or department that other UMass campuses have who are dedicated to logistics, planning, and operations? So that's, uh, what's your name? Uh, Nathaniel. Nathaniel, that's, that's a very good question, and thank you for the question. Uh, so just two weeks ago, I was at a sustainability conference for um, college presidents put on by Second Nature and the Intentional Endowment Network, uh, which I sit on the advisory board of. And um, I sat on a panel talking about what can we as presidents or chancellors do on our campuses to push forward um, the whole notion of sustainability, addressing issues related to climate change. And I actually left that conference, and, and keep in mind, I've been involved with this you know, some five, six, seven years now, um, you know, at a, 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 on a national level. And I walked out of there, and I haven't quite figured out how I'm going to talk about it yet, but I do believe that climate change is one of the issues of the 21st century, and that as a campus community, we have to figure out how to make that core to our values and who we are and what we are about. In terms of creating an office of sustainability, like other campuses um, or some of the other campuses have within the UMass system or campuses across the country, uh, my commitment to you is we will get there to come up with a real plan. Uh, when, if you were here when she, when Donna talked about the strategic plan, I think one of the bullets was was about under community was about sustainability. So it's going to be part of our DNA and who we are. Just like I say. If we're not preparing students for the future of work, um, uh, that we're committing educational malpractice, I'm going to add on to that. If we're not dealing with this issue of climate or our planet with more than 7 billion people and how we're treating, tr treating the planet and preparing our students to, to live and work in that type of environment, that we're co uh, committing educational malpractice. You say, well, why do I say that? Because the individuals who have the facts, who have the data, uh, about climate, and or who just look at it from the time that they were a kid to today, and they deny it. Those individuals were educated on one of our college campuses, and somewhere we we fail. And I'm not and when I'm, I'm not suggesting that we become zealots and that every graduate must believe in climate change. No, what I'm saying is every graduate must understand data and information, and truth, and facts, and be able to have a, a, a conversation. <laughs> and when there's truth, accept that there's truth. <laughs> and when you're wrong, accept that you're wrong. And when you're right, fight for it no matter what. I think that's part of what we have to do here within the academy, here within higher education. So I'm very committed to this cause, and I've been involved long before uh, I ever joined UMass Dartmouth. Other questions? I want to thank you all. Um, you know, David, David Gingerella, you know, so he was here for, the, for a week, and then he closed campus for you all for a day. <laughs> Give him a hand. <laughs> so, Service awards are coming up. There's a reception. Reset refreshments will start shortly yeah. while you're waiting. Okay. So we're going to have service awards back in here shortly. There are refreshments outside. Eat, drink, and be merry. Have 
But stay. <laughs> Thank you.